Would you pray with me? Father, we, as a, as a nation, Lord God, as a church, as families, as individuals, Lord, we are intentionally stepping into a, a season of thanksgiving, a season, Lord God, where we give thanks, count our blessings for the many things that, that you've given to us. And Lord, I pray, Father, this morning that you would help us pivot from wherever we are, whatever we're doing, pivot our hearts and our minds and our souls to really think about what it means to give thanks, what it means to be thankful, Lord God, because there are, there are moments, those first moments that are glorious, and then those last moments that are difficult and painful, and there are moments in between, Lord God, that sometimes make it very difficult for us to be able to count those blessings. I pray, Father God, that your word, that your Holy Spirit would inspire us to be thankful. In Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, amen. I tell you, I'm thankful for a lot of things. I'm thankful for a great, a great staff and sharing Jeremiah who put on a great fall festival this, this year. By the way, there's going to be a slide that's going to be open afterwards if you want to try it. If, if you want to try it. Some adults, if you want to try it, the slide's going to be open. I'm thankful for Jeremiah who actually he... He talked about this series, but he's the actual one that came up with this series, this idea of different characters in the Bible that reflected a life of thankfulness. And I just want to say, praise God, praise God for Jeremiah and for his leadership. And yeah, amen. I'm, I'm just thankful for him. <laughs> thankful for him. I'm thankful for um, Daniel Christmas putting together again a, a week of great video and, and Steve Simpson, one of our elders, having fun with it and just kind of taking us back to that senior picture moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm thankful I'm thankful for this church family in so many different ways. This is a season of Thanksgiving, so just to begin, why don't we start with reading a very familiar passage. Read this with me. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Keep thanks from him and praise his name. Psalm 100, what? Does something seem a bit off there? What's it supposed to say? Thanksgiving and then Give thanks to him. That's right. You know this. Over and over in scripture, when you see the word thanks, it's usually riding shotgun with this concept, this idea of, of giving. They ride together over and over and over. Thanks and give, give, thanks, thanksgiving. Over and over. As a matter of fact, if you were just to get out your phones and you were going to Bible Gateway and do a quick search of the word thanks, you'll find that it shows up about 100 times, 100 times in the Old and New Testament, the word thanks shows up, and 93 out of those 100 times it shows up, it's attached to the concept of giving, thanksgiving, giving thanks. It's side by side, over and over and over, and you think, well, why do you, why do you think that is? Could it be that God designed thanks to be given? That the idea of feeling gratitude, experiencing gratitude, something that God has blessed you with and given, that it's designed to be given back in some way, shape, or form. It's not designed to be taken. Thanks is not designed to be kept to ourselves. It's why I'm, I'm a bit surprised oftentimes when we, when we tell people, you know, oh, they know how thankful I am for them. I don't, I don't need to say anything. I, you know, they, they just already know. It surprises me because when, when we have kids, we, we often teach them just the opposite. We teach them to be thankful, right? I mean, almost about after everything, we just kind of say, make sure you say thank you. Make sure you say thank you. Make sure you... We say that. And somehow, as we grow older and wiser and smarter as adults, we forget the very thing that we're teaching our kids. To take those really important moments to look at not just the important people in our life, but just people in general. And just to say thanks. Thanks. As a, as a matter of fact, I mean, th think about it. When was the last time you were ever insulted for somebody saying thank you? Have you ever just been put off by somebody saying, hey, thanks for your support? Thanks for your help with that project. I really needed it. Thanks for your friendship. Or have you ever been really been out of shape when somebody says, ah, it's an avocado. Thanks. <laughs> that was a joke for this group right here. This wasn't meant for you. It's apparently a meme, right? My kids say you probably don't get bent out of shape when people say thanks. As a matter of fact, there's probably never been a time when you thought, wow, can you believe the audacity of that person? They told me thanks again. Those people are so grateful. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Matter of fact, with just the opposite. Probably all of us at some time or another, we've been a little bent out of shape by people that we perceive to be a little ungrateful in our lives. 
being thankful, we see as you look through the scripture over and over and over, the people that reflect thankfulness, the people that proclaim thankfulness, the commands of being thankful, over and over and over, you see that thankfulness is this idea. It's, it's a conscientious choice to give our gratitude away. Being thankful is a choice to give gratitude away. It's expressing thankfulness not only in the, in the, in the good times, and by the way, there's There's a lot of good times for us to be thankful for, but the Bible says, rejoice always, pray continually, read that with me, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Not just in the good times, and by the way, we should count our blessings because they are many, whether we see them or not, we should count our blessings, and we tell people that during this season, we should count them. But it doesn't just say for those good things, it says in all circumstances, In all seasons, and the truth is, you may be in a circumstance or a season for some time now that you're finding a little trouble counting. As a matter of fact, you you may be able to count other things that aren't such a blessing in this season that you're not thankful for because you might be in a season of loneliness, a season of of doubt or of hurt or of pain and And you're just struggling to cobble together any type of list whatsoever. And I want to say this. I want to say that God sees you. God hears you. God understands you. And this morning, I believe through his word and by his spirit, God has a word to speak to you this morning to help encourage you to be thankful in all circumstances, in all seasons of your life, to teach us to be thankful together. Now, in order to do that, the Lord's going to introduce us to someone really special, an incredible woman in the scriptures um, that probably, when you read her life in just two short chapters, you realize she probably didn't have very many blessings to count. And yet, in her circumstance, in the season of life that she she was dealt, she chooses to be thankful, not so much in the words that she speaks, maybe in the words that she doesn't speak. She chooses to be thankful in the way that she treats others around her, and she chooses to be thankful in the way that she walks humbly before God. She chooses thankfulness and to give her thankfulness in a way, as, as a way of life. And we read about a story in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to start there. And here's what, I, I just love God's word, how it unfolds and tells these stories within stories. If you just look at kind of a 30,000 you know, foot view of the book of Samuel, realize it's about three great men. It's about the prophet Samuel, Samuel who God raised up as this, the last judge of Israel, but this prophet, this, this prophet who would one day install the very first king of Israel. And then from there, from King Saul, then would come the man after God's own heart, the next king, his name would be? David, right. And so it's really about Samuel, it's about Saul, it's about David. And even though this book, 1 Samuel, is about three great men, I love how God works. It doesn't begin with any great man. It begins with a story about a great woman. A great woman who really didn't have very many blessings to count. It starts with an unlikely hero named Hannah. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, the first two verses really gives us an understanding of the season that she's living in right now. And it's probably not feeling like Thanksgiving for her. It begins by saying, there was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. And Penina had children. Read that with me, the last part. But Hannah had none. In the first two verses, we don't hear about Samuel, we don't hear about Saul, we don't hear about David. We hear about three characters, though, Elkanah, Hannah, and and Penina. And right off the bat, we see that they're dealing with some big family issues. You talk about dysfunction that's happening. There's dysfunction that's happening in this family. And these, these issues are probably not not issues that would make it on anybody's counter blessings list. Certainly, these two issues, the issue of polygamy and for infertility, those probably wouldn't make it on your counter blessings list. Those are two big issues that are, that are in this text. And the first one, polygamy, seems somewhat foreign to us in our Western culture. The other one, the second one, infertility, is really somewhat of a painful reality 
reality, even in our culture, actually one out of six couples in America are dealing with infertility right now. One out of six couples. So it's a big issue. And what we see here is that even though polygamy and infertility, these are two issues that, 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 are, that are real, they're actually tied together through Bible culture and Bible times. And let me explain why. Hannah is listed on this, in this story, as the first wife mentioned, which denotes that she probably was Elkanah's first wife. She was the first wife that Elkanah took, but here's, here's what we ha- happened, probably. We see this in the text. She was barren. She was childless, apparently not able to have children. Her womb was closed. And, and as a result, this, this made it very difficult for her in that culture because having children meant a lot. It means a lot to us, but for them, it was a way of life. They needed to have children in order to be able to work the family farm. They needed children in order to learn the family trade. They needed children in order to inherit the land so it could be passed through and carry on the family name. It was, children were loved and appreciated just because they were their children, but, but much more than that, children for, for them in that culture was a way of survival. Children were also, you know, Hannah and Elkanah's retirement plan. Wouldn't that be good, mom and dad? It was their retirement plan. Because the children would end up taking care of their parents. I think we should reinstate that again. That would be terrific. And here we see that Hannah was childless. Penina, she had children. But Hannah had none. So in in order to, to get an offspring, to secure an offspring, this is where polygamy factors into this dysfunctional marriage, this relationship. A man would have to take on another wife. And I, I want to I say here, this, this needs to be addressed because you may see this in the scriptures as you look different places. The Bible does talk about examples of polygamy. We see it over and over with certain patriarchs and certain men within the scriptures. And I want to tell you that even though you see it as an example in the scripture, God never condones polygamy. Never. It's not, his, it's not his plan A. It's not even his plan B. God never condones it. As a matter of fact, every time you see it pop up in the life of a person, almost every time, it, it shows up as something negative, not something positive. There's some type of dysfunction associated with that network and that group, that family, that family. There's something that's breaking down. God, God never designed for it to be that way. As a matter of fact, in the beginning, his plan A was Adam Eve, one man, one woman, joined together in a monogamous relationship. That was his divine design. And we see that, that truth, that standard carried over to the New Testament. In the New Testament, when God says, hey, I want to raise up leaders in my church to govern and lead, they're called elders or shepherds. He goes, they have to be men, husbands of but one wife. Because even in, in New Testament times, there are people living polygamous relationships. And God says, no, listen, my design was, my divine design was one man, one woman, together in a monogamous relationship of marriage. That was it. That's what he upheld. That's what he valued. He said, these are the type of people that I want to lead my church, my my family. So we, we see it. God has upheld that standard from the beginning to the end. And when people deviate outside of that standard, God tells us there's bound to be heartbreak. He doesn't necessarily tell us. We just see it. There's bound to be heartbreak, and, and the marriage structure breaks down. And this certainly rings true for Hannah. Penina had many children, Hannah had none. And then we pick up verse 3, it says, Year after year, this man, Elkanah, went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty. At Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Just kind of stop there for a second. I just want to say as a side note, if you continue to read through the book of Samuel, you'll, you'll realize relatively quickly why people don't name their kids Hophni and Phinehas anymore. All right? There's a, there's a good reason why it's only re, Phineas is only reserved for like a platypus. There's a good reason. He's no, no, no more. As a matter of fact, this is, this is what gives preacher's kids a bad name. Hophni and Phineas give preacher kids a really bad name. So I digress. Here it goes. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept 
and she would not eat. And her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? And once they finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah just stood up. We, we see the defunction and the heartbreak and the breakdown in the, the family system right here. That there is this rivalry that is between these two wives. Each year they go to this place called Shiloh to, to worship. And really it's supposed to be a family celebration, a family gathering. But it's very painful for, for Hannah. We see that. Because there's a time when they gather around for this meal. And in this meal, different portions are passed out to different family members. And so we have Penina, and Penina is getting some for, for her, but also for all of her sons and all of her daughters. And it becomes, at that moment, a painful reminder. Now, Elkanah, to his credit, he loves Hannah. And he says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give her a double portion. But even receiving a double portion is just a reminder that this is for me and for me. Hannah is, is grieved. It's, it's, it's just a reminder to us. And on top of that, you have, you have Penina. Penina says that she's her rival. It says that twice in the text. And that word rival means an adversary or enemy. It's, it's really, really strong. And she's, she's provoking her to irritate her. Now, that word irritate her in Hebrew means to cause to thunder. She's provoking. She's poking at her to cause her really just to in this thunderous way, just to blow her top and just to lose her cool. I mean, just to explode. But she, but she doesn't. And you think to yourself, well, at least, you know, she's got her rival, Penina. At least she has an understanding husband who's concerned about her not eating or why is she weeping or why is she so downcast. But, but even with all of his attentions, you see that Elkanah, he, he still, he, he doesn't get it. Like most, most men, he doesn't get it. <laughs> he doesn't get the painful reality that she's going through. That this, this hurts not to have a child. And he's trying to fix it because us guys, we try to fix it and we just can't fix what we can't fix, what only God can fix. And he's, he's trying to speak to her and then he asks her this question. This kind of just puts an exclamation point into his cluelessness. He says, aren't I worth more to you than 10 sons? You, you can almost imagine him beating in the chest and saying, hey, come on, baby. <laughs> what do you need 10 boys for when you got me? Come on. You know, it's just, it just kind of crazy. He, he really is kind of not, not getting it. And so afterwards, you, you think, Hannah, she could, just, she could just flip her lid and thunder, just explode and just lash out at Penina, but she doesn't. That she could just snap in a moment at Elkanah, who's completely clueless, and you would think it's justified somewhat, but she doesn't. She remains silent and eventually stands up and, and moves on and this is how she didn't say anything to be thankful, but she was living out what thankfulness should be like in our lives. That there are times, there are times when there are paninas in our lives that are tormenting us. Anybody ever have somebody in your life that just seems like their mission in life is just to get under your skin? You know what I mean? I mean, they say things to you, they, they, do, they just know the buttons to push, and they show up, and you try to prepare yourself for, for the paninas of this world, but when you show up, Man, they, they just figured it out, and they just get there. And she could have lashed out, but she, she didn't. She, she chose to show grace when none was being shown to her, not by her rivals, not by her husband. When none was being shown to her, she lived out thankfulness. And I'll say, there, there may be people in your life that are, that are provoking you to anger. And you show thankfulness, the grace that you've been shown, you show that not by saying anything to defend yourself, sometimes by just remaining silent. And there may be people that, that are close to you that you love, and for all their best intentions of trying to fix you, they just, they just don't get it. And it hurts that they don't get what you're going through. And the best thing that you could do maybe is just to remove yourself from the situation for a moment and not to snap back at them but just to turn it over to the Lord. Hannah teaches us this incredible lesson of living out thankfulness, that sometimes we need to be quiet, we need to remove ourselves, and then we need to take our case before the Lord. And Hannah does that very thing. P picking up at verse 9, it continues on. It says, Now Eli, 
Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost at the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and do not forget your servant, but give her a son, and I will give, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will be used on his head. And she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Now Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And so Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled, and, and I've, been drinking, I've not been drinking wine nor beer. I was pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Here's the second way she models thankfulness. She models in the fact that she leaves that place of humiliation, and instead of just keep walking, abandoning her family, her responsibilities, everything else, abandoning God, instead of walking away from the Lord, she runs to the Lord. She goes to the Lord's house, and she prays, and she makes this promise, this vow before the Lord, saying, I'll, I'll dedicate my son, Lord, if you will give me that son. I'll, I'll give him over to you. And this is how we can choose thankfulness as well. There are certain times that there are people, there are circumstances, and we just want to run as far away from God as we possibly can, but we show our thankfulness to God by running to him and not away from him. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that this priest, this man of God, he's sitting in the door, he's watching Hannah, and he jumps to some wrong conclusions. He sees her, he, she's speaking, she's praying, her mouth is moving, no words are coming out, and so his first inclination is to think, oh, well, she's a lush. <laughs> Here she is, wasted in the house of worship. It's terrible. So he rebukes her. And I love, I love Hannah's response. Not so. Not so, my Lord. I, I've, I've not been self-medicating with alcohol or beer or anything else. I, I've not been doing that. I've not been pouring anything into my life. As a matter of fact, I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord that he would hear me and answer my prayers. I'll just pause there for a moment because this is, this is, this is strong, strong example. In, in seasons when, when we're pressed and God is calling us to be thankful f- for him, even when it seems like we're to be thankful for nothing, there's an inclination to, to run from God and to self-medicate, to run from God and begin to pour things into our, our, our souls, alcohol, and marijuana, and pornography, or gambling, or irrelicit relationships. There's just a way that we just keep pouring it and pouring it and pouring it in order that we can escape the reality that we want to stay away from. And God says, that's, that's not the way to go. Look at Hannah. Instead of running from it, running from God, run to God. And pour yourself out rather than pouring those things into your soul for destruction. Eli, he couldn't see what she was doing, and so he jumps to all the wrong conclusions, and listen, we we can do the same thing. We jump to wrong conclusions when we see people sometimes grieving and and hurting and working through that process. It reminds me of the story of this mother that was pushing a cart in Walmart. In her cart was her son who was just screaming the whole time in that cart, And, and this little boy, as she was pushing it, and he was screaming. The, the mom began to speak out loud to herself, and she said, it's okay, Peyton. Calm, calm, calm down, Peyton. <laughs> Peyton, it'll be all right. <laughs> we're almost done shopping, Peyton. We're, we're going to be home soon, Peyton. And so she's walking around saying this, and, and so the store clerk, you know, notices. And the store clerk is so impressed. She comes over and she says, listen, I just want to say to you, you're to be commended for how incredibly patient you are with your little Peyton. And the mother looks up from, you know, gripping that cart. She looks up with tears in her eyes, and she looks at the store clerk, and she says, Lady, I'm Peyton. <laughs> Hannah, Hannah wasn't just self-medicating, and she wasn't just speaking to herself. Hannah recognized her brokenness, as a matter of fact, some would say that brokenness wasn't just brokenness. In those times, in that culture, they would say she was cursed by God with the affliction of being barren. 
And you hear it in the language that she describes her own station life. She says, I'm in deep anguish. I'm weeping bitterly. Servant's misery, deeply troubled, deep, great anguish and grief. And yet here's what I love. Even though she recognizes this is where she is, that she's in a place where she's not beyond God's reach. She was turning to the Lord Almighty for hope and strength. And, and when she says Lord Almighty, that, that word is also, you can hear it sometimes in scriptures, as the Lord of hosts. And it means the Lord of angel armies, actually. It means the one that's a commander, the one that speaks and everybody else, the one that's a commander of all the angel armies in the celestial realm. I'm calling out to him to dispatch them on my behalf for for my need. She knows that there's no way she's going to change the season or the station in life, but she knows the one who can. And she's crying out to him to dispatch the angel armies. Lord Almighty, Lord of hosts, if you would only, if you would only. God, God was working. This angel, God of the angel, was working on Hannah's behalf, even if she didn't see it. And even if I look in the text, and maybe you do too, and, and can't quite understand it. God was working. It's mentioned twice in here that God had closed Hannah's womb. Have you, have you noticed that? I don't know about you, but that's, that, those, are, those are puzzling pieces of Scripture for me. I, I don't know how God closes the womb, and I don't know why God closes the womb. I, I don't. I don't presume to know either one. I have questions like you, questions where you look at some families and you, you look at children born, beautiful children born into to families with parents who have no right to be parents. And I see the injustice of that and I, I, just, I just shake my head and think, God, why? That would have been a good womb to close. And then I pray with parents. You have family members you have friends. You know that one in six who are struggling with infertility right now, and they're incredible people. They would make these incredible parents. You know what I mean? Incredible parents. And you're saying, God, why? Why, why is their womb closed? Why are they waiting? And I wish I, could, I wish I could tell you how it happens, and I wish I could tell you why it happens, but I, but I can't. The Lord knows, and he's not telling right now. But here's what, I, here's what I do know. I do know as I continue to flip through the pages of the scriptures forward and backward from this account, I do, I do see that some of the strongest heroes of faith in the Bible were women who dealt with infertility. They were women who were seasoned, they were childless, and they were praying and crying out to God. I see Sarai, Sarah, Abraham's wife, who become the father of many nations, and she would be, she would be the one behind that. I see Rebecca, Isaac's, Isaac's wife. I see Leah, Leah and Rachel, who would end up having the 12, the sons of the 12 tribes of Israel. I see those stories and I recognize that these aren't, these aren't just women who were, like according to the culture, these weren't, these weren't women that were cursed. These were women that God had a special blessing for in his, his timing. These are women that were pillars to the pillars of faith. And I wanted to say to anyone who is waiting, to the one in six that may be our friends, a part of our family here, God has not cursed you. That you are not broken, you are not defective, you are not forgotten. That God, I believe with all my heart, God has not just something, but God has someone, someone exceptional set apart for you and for your family. And all God's people said, amen. May we be mindful of those one in six, and may we surround them with our, our love and our care and our prayers, because God has not forgotten you, and we shouldn't either. Penina and with Elkanah, we, we know that we've all dealt with Peninas. People that are set against us, we've all dealt with Elkanahs, people that are close to us and yet they still hurt us. We've probably even dealt with Eli's. I've probably been, been an Eli. 
people that you look to for support and guidance and leadership, and yet we have a way, I have a way at times of disappointing. And between the Paninas and the Elkanas and, and the Elis in our life, we want to say, we just want to run as far away from God as possible. I've noticed that. People don't generally run away from God first. They run away from the people that say they represent God that hurt them. And then down the road, they find that distance between them and God is comfortable and maybe even comforting. Here's what I love about Hannah. Hannah showed her thanks by refusing to let people and circumstances define her, her faith in God, define what she knew to be true in God's faithfulness, and she trusted God's faithfulness, and that's how she lived out, being thankful. I'll say this, Eli redeemed himself a little bit here. At the very end of this passage, we're going to see Eli, he redeems himself by, by seeing Hannah's earnestness and even recognizing that she was, in fact, sober. And he says this, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you all that you've asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went away, and she ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. You see, something's changed. Something's changed in Hannah, even even when her circumstances said you shouldn't be thankful, she decided to choose thankfulness. She's going to choose it. She's going to choose to show grace when there was no grace being shown. She was going to choose to run to God instead of running away from God. And as she did that, as she lived out that thankfulness, something began to happen. The darkness and that downcast spirit began to lift from her countenance, and she was being changed. Verses 19 through 28 finishes up the chapter. Here's what it says. And early the next morning, they arose, they being Elkanah and Hannah and probably Penina. They arose and they worshiped before the Lord and they went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And so in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, and this is the way she understood this name to mean, because I asked the Lord for him. And when her husband Elkanah went up, with all of his family to offer an annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She did not, she did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned Weaned him, and, and only may the Lord make good his word. Now, that's interesting right there. Hang on to that. Only may the Lord make good his word. And so the woman stayed home, and she nursed her son until he had been weaned. And after his wean, she took the boy, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord, house of the Lord at Shiloh. And when the bull had been sacrificed, when they brought the boy to Eli, and then she said to him, and I, I love this part. I love this part. Now, I want to say this, this most scholars believe it's been about three years that he's from, went from infancy to about three years. That's when they would be weaned off. And here's, here's why they think that. This three-year-old bull would be the sacrifice matching the three years that, that she had raised his son. And she was ready to deliver him over to be kind of self-sustaining on his own, wouldn't need to be nursed now in the house of the Lord. Um, and so they, they believe he's about three years old. So it's maybe three years since... It's been three years since Eli has seen Hannah. And so she comes up to, to him with this boy in her arms. And she, and she says, pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I'm the woman who stood, stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child. I'm the woman who stood here. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. The story could have been much different there. She could have said, I'm the woman. This is the child that I prayed for. Thanks. And she could have kept that blessing. She could have taken that blessing back home with her. I mean, after all, it was God's gift to her, this, this son. But she didn't. The story continues in a way that seems radically sacrificial to us. This is, this is that son, so now I, what's the word? Give. Thanks. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. This is, this is thanksgiving 
at a level I can't even begin to fathom. I can't even begin to wrap my head around what it means to be thanks and the, the very thing I've been praying for and God provides in a miraculous way, all of a sudden now he's calling me and, and I'm making a choice, choosing to give over to the Lord. This, this, is, this is an amazing story because Hannah, at this point, she knew she had a vow to fulfill. Remember? She says, I, I, if you give me a son, I'll, I'll, I tell you, I'll dedicate him to your service. No razor will ever touch his head. And this is, that's not just kind of a weird thing she's saying. She's not saying, hey, I'm going to boycott great clips or anything like that. I mean, this is, this is a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow where somebody is completely dedicated over to the service of the Lord. So there are a couple of things. One, a Nazarite vow, when a parent dedicates or they dedicate themselves, they're never going to touch anything from the fruit of the vine. So no grape juice, no wine, no grape jelly. That'd be kind of tough. Also, they're not supposed to touch any dead body. It's not so tough. And then the other thing was that they're not to have any razor touch their head. So no haircuts, no trims in the beard, no, no beard wax, none of that happening. They're just supposed to live wild. And it really set them apart for service to the Lord. There was one other, there was one other kind of major New Testament person that was, what was his name? Samson, he took that Nazarite vow. His life didn't really kind of live in congruency with that Nazarite vow, but he took that, that, Nazarite, that Nazarite vow, his family dedicated in that way. She knew she made this vow, and she had to now fulfill it. It's, it's interesting to me that her husband, Elkanah, said, now may the Lord only make good his word. What, is, what does that mean? Because, did, I mean, she's holding the baby. He sees a son. Didn't the Lord already make good his word? I mean, when she felt that promise, may the Lord bless you and grant what you've been praying for, and now that you wouldn't he be the evidence of God had already fulfilled his end of the covenant, the promise, to Hannah? But it almost, he leaves it like a cliffhanger, like there's something else God wanted to do. And I think this is important for us to, to pick up in the text that there was more. Hannah understood, I think even Elkanah understood, that Samuel represented something more than a promise for, for Hannah. It certainly was, and it blessed him, but it was a bigger promise than that. And we see that it's true. Samuel would be the key player in the book of Samuel that would set off this chain reaction to see the first king of Israel installed. And from that first king of Israel to seeing King David installed. And from King David on down through the lineage and the line to see who? King Jesus come to planet earth and save us from our sin. And we see that she, she, she recognized this in a prayer that she prays, a prayer of thanksgiving in the next chapter. In verse 10, the second half of that says, he will give strength to his king, meaning David, and exalt the horn of his anointed, his anointed one. They, scholars believe that means Jesus, the Messiah to come. She understood that this was a bigger promise than just for her. It was a promise for her, but it was more than just a promise for her. God has a way of doing that. Have you ever noticed? He can fulfill his promises to us and at the same time accomplish something greater if we're faithful through it, something greater in his kingdom. Amen? God has the ability to do that. I want to tell you that God gave her a son, and like Elkanah said, he, he had to make good on his word, and he did. He made good on that word that would ultimately translate to God giving you a son, his only begotten son, who would live, live 33 years sinless, reflecting the love of God, thankfulness in all that he did for the people that he encountered, for the father that he served. And for that, he would be hung on a cross, this son given to you and to me, dedicated to the Lord's service in order that we might be cleansed of our sin and have the promise of eternal life. He's given us a son to fulfill a promise. And the thing is, Many of us, we're so thankful that we have received him, this, this son. And what do, what do we do when the Lord comes now to ask us? We've made a promise. God, I promise to deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow you daily. That's my promise. What happens when we begin to live that out in the life of the son? I received a phone call from a friend of mine about a week and a half ago 
and he's from Puerto Rico, and he has this couple of missionaries from Puerto Rico who are looking for a host home to stay in while, while they actually um, come to a conference here in St. Louis. Two, two gals. And um, I say that because if there's any of you that would like to host two missionary gals from Puerto Rico uh, for a couple of days in December, we'd love, we'd love for you to contact me, the office, and we'd love to set that up. But we started talking. Wally and I started talking. Some of you remember Wally and Manena Pedieta. And Wally and Manena, great family. Wally and Manena, both from Puerto Rico. Um, he works for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so there was a time when he was offered a position in, in Puerto Rico. And yet, at the same time, he said that, that he and his wife felt like they were supposed to move the States for a specific reason. He says, for years, as a married couple, um, they were missionaries in YWAM for years. They had prayed and they asked the Lord to provide for them a child, but they were told that Manena could never have children, that she'll never have children. And so... As they prayed and prayed and prayed, the Lord impressed upon Wally through his spirit. He says, you need to, you need to move to the U.S., and I'm going to help you start your family, possibly through, through adoption. And, and Wally kind of questioned that. He said, you know, Lord, I am Puerto Rican, <laughs> and it may, be, it may be more advantageous for me to, to adopt domestically in Puerto Rico than for me to move to the United States, and as a Puerto Rican, adopt internationally there. It may be, I'm just saying, it's just a little crazy, but Lord... But the Lord impressed upon him in a hard way, you need to go. And so he did. He come and came to St. Louis at the, you know, to, to look at different churches kind of as a, as a scout. And he came to Gateway Christian Church, first, first time here. He came on the very last Sunday in December, the very last Sunday, which, which tells you usually the senior minister is not preaching. As a matter of fact, usually a youth minister is preaching. Thank you for that, Jeremiah. And um, on that very last Sunday, and we at the time, we had this incredible youth minister named Josh Huff. And Josh Huff, and Jesse Huff, just amazing examples. They were really passionate about what? Adoption. And so here's Josh. They're getting ready to adopt their third beautiful girl from China. And Josh is up here speaking. Wally is sitting out in the audience. First time to St. Louis. First time to the Americas. He's here. And he's listening to Josh Huff speak about adoption. And he just all of a sudden feels this confirming, loving power come over him like, yes, God, I hear you. I see that you're going to help us start. I don't know how, but I hear you help us start our family through, through adoption. That was confirmed. So he, he set up camp. He just, you know, invited his wife. They began to come here regularly. They joined here at Gateway Christian Church, began to serve and teach in different capacities. And then they got involved in our life group. You mean Carrie and the Benzingers and the Brownings and the Toriolas. There are a lot of us that are getting together and we're praying. And, and through this process, Wally and Manana, they begin to tell us, hey, we're, we're going to adopt. And we're like, that's, that's incredible. We're going to pray and walk alongside of you. And don't know how it's going to happen because they didn't have the finances necessarily to make it happen. Um, he was working a couple of jobs, one at a fast food subway shop and then also for the USDA just to, just to have money to be able to do this. And so we got to walk alongside and at different times in the life group got to hear this story. And it was just so powerful. And then one day, we're at a, a volleyball, we're at a volleyball um, tournament, I think in Springfield. And I get a call from Wally and Wally says, Hey, Carl, we need you to begin to pray for us because there, there's this single mother. She's young and she's going to have a child and she's got three different families to choose from and she, she wants it to go to the people that speak Spanish, which they cornered the market in that area right there at that point. And so they were able to go to the hospital and see this little baby and just in a steamroll of quick events, they were able to adopt this child, this beautiful family, couple, brown-haired, brown-eyed, were able to adopt this beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby boy, and his name is Daniel, Danilo, as they call him. And God did an incredible work. He had someone set apart just for them, just for them. And they were thankful through the whole process. It was about few months, maybe eight months later, he came to me and says, Carl, I feel like the Lord is telling me that I need to move to, to Washington, D.C. I was like, the Lord's not telling me that, dude. <laughs> it's because I'm a friend and I want him to stay put. I said, he goes, no, I really do. He goes, I think the, the Lord's offering me a position there and, and also that I believe our family is going to continue to grow if, if we're able to be obedient and go. I'm like, all right, go then, be obedient to God and grow your family, do it. And so he does. Wally Manena and Danilo, they moved to D.C., they set up a home, and um, we're getting back and forth, text, they, they visit every once in a while, live groups at the Benzingers, and it's just really incredible to see, and then, lo and behold, 
Just a few months later, we all at different times get this call. Benita starts calling Carrie and Benzinger's and Carla and begins to call and say, hey, I just want to tell you guys, we don't know how, but, but our family's going to grow. We're thinking, wow, you're going to adopt again. That's going to be great. It's going to be incredible. And he's like, no, somehow, somehow, some way, even though against all odds, against what the doctor said, Manena, Manena's pregnant. And she's going to have a baby. And so they go full term. They have this beautiful little baby. And wouldn't you know it, her name is Hannah. Hannah. God has an amazing way of fulfilling his promise to us. And even as you hear now, what God can do, he has a way of fulfilling a promise that far reaches, reaches further than Wally and Manana, perhaps to encourage you in whatever season or station in life that you're finding it difficult to be thankful. Would you read this with me again the right way? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. There's a reason it's not called thanksgiving or thanks taking, and that is because it's a choice. We choose to be thankful. And may this season, may the, more than words or making lists, may we choose in the way that we live to be thankful to the Lord and thankful to the people around us. Amen, church? Would you stand to your feet? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for power of an, an ordinary life, a life that struggled to count blessings, a life like some of ours. I thank you, Lord God, for the example that in every circumstance, she didn't only say she was thankful, Lord, she really, she really modeled how to live it out. And I pray, Father God, that you would help us to find the same courage to do the same thing. And Lord, I, I pray that we would understand that we too... We too have been the recipient of you making good on your word and bringing to us a son. And if there's anyone that's, that's never received the son Jesus who died for them, who rose from the grave to give them the hope and promise of eternal life, that today, Father God, you would give them the courage and the boldness to leave their brokenness and to say, I, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. I pray, Father God, that you would give them the courage to do that this morning. And for any, anyone else, Lord God, that's been, that's been running, that's been lashing out, I pray, Father God, that you would give them the freedom to not run to those things, but really to run to you, Lord God, this morning, to come to this altar and just to know that you are an incredible, beautiful, loving Savior that's here for them. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people say.